tell you, I'm so happy to be here. And um, I've been living in Germany for a year and a half now. And uh, this is my first time speaking back at the East Coast AR since I moved to Germany. And I have been traveling all around the world giving talks to activists and also to non-vegans. And this place right here is my favorite place in the entire world to be speaking. <laughs> so so um, I want to share um, some of what I've been seeing and learning with you today, um, talking about um, vegan success specifically, why we don't see the success of our global movement, the fact that we're a part of a global movement, why it's so important that we do recognize this success, and so ways that we can take the momentum and even grow it. So I want to just start out with a question, um, and I just realized that I didn't introduce myself. So um, I'm Melanie Joy, and I'm an author, psychologist, and founder and president of Beyond Carnism. And, um, and a professor of psychology and sociology as well. <laughs> and I have been for the past five years on an international speaking tour where I've had the opportunity to travel all around the world and to meet with people um, who are leaders in the vegan movement and many, many, many activists and of course also many non-vegans because many of my talks are geared toward non-vegans. One of the things that I see over and over again is that wherever I go, vegans tend to feel that we're not really making much progress, if any, at all. So why is this the case? Well, you know, we don't actually get a lot of coverage, a lot of news coverage, on the fact that you know, 65 billion animals a year are being slaughtered for their flesh and other body parts, or the fact that the vegan movement is exploding and mushrooming because we're not, what is this? Uh, hunk in racist rants. Uh, hulk, hunk. We're not a hulk in racist rants. The things that make the news are not the things that most of us care about that much. They don't make the news also in part because of carnism. And I'm going to briefly, a lot of you are familiar with my work on carnism, but for those of you who are not, I'm going to just briefly introduce what it is. So carnism is the invisible belief system that conditions people to eat certain animals. It's essentially the opposite of veganism, right? We tend to the dominant culture, and even many vegans still tend to believe that it's only vegans and vegetarians who follow a belief system. But when eating animals is not a necessity, um, then it's a choice, and choices always stem from beliefs. Now, carnism maintains itself. It's organized against core human values. Most people would not support the slaughter of innocent beings if they were really aware of what was going on. Um, and so carnism needs to maintain itself through using these defense mechanisms, through creating a set of myths, a set of stories. One type of defense mechanisms are pro-carnist. I call them primary defenses. They support this myth that, for example, eating animals is normal, natural, and necessary. You've heard this before, right? Thousands and thousands of times. Um, another type of defense is I call secondary defenses. These are anti-vegan, okay? So they promote the myth not eating animals is abnormal, unnatural, and unnecessary, right? So in order to stay alive, carnism needs to do two things. It needs to keep itself strong and validate itself eating animals, and it also needs to keep the vegan movement weak, or at least keep us believing that the vegan movement is weak, which is almost as good in some ways. Carnism teaches us to think of animals are objects, and vegans are not jobs. <laughs> so a lot of the stereotypes we hear are the result of these simplistic defenses. Well, seriously, if you believe in certain rational crazies, we learn to think there is no problem. There's no oppression. There's no system of oppression. It's just the way things are. And we also learn to believe there is no vegan movement. Now, one thing that's important to know about secondary defenses is that they're a part of a backlash. Does everyone know what a backlash is? Okay, it's a reaction of the dominant culture when it's actually threatened, okay? So what we're seeing is that as these primary defenses are weakened, as people start to really think, is it really necessary to eat animals? Is it really normal and natural? As primary defenses are weakened, what do you think happens to secondary defenses? They increase, right? So this is a part of the backlash. And this means secondary defenses are actually a sign of our success, not our failure. One of the things that happens is that vegans hear about, for example, happy meat and are going, oh my god, despite all of our efforts, now we've got to contend with happy meat. 
And I would say it's not in spite of our efforts, it's because of them. It's because we have been successful enough in getting the dominant culture to start really questioning the ethics of eating animals on a global scale for the first time in human history. This is a sign of our success, not our failure. So when we recognize secondary defenses for what they are, we can really decrease our despair. Despair is the Achilles heel of the movement. Despair is the feeling of hopelessness. Despair is something that has plagued activists and social justice movements throughout history. And it is an incredibly powerful tool of an oppressive system. I'm not saying that this is consciously created by the oppressive system, but it is created, it is manufactured. And we can also more effectively strategize. I mean, backlash is normal, natural, and it's not necessary, but it's normal and natural. I mean, imagine like, you know, if we were playing a game of chess and every time we made a great move and the other person made a counter move, we thought, oh God, we must have screwed up. <laughs> right? Like imagine how we would play. So there are two particular myths I want to challenge, I want to talk about today. Um, one is the myth that people don't care, okay? This is how many of you have come against this myth in your own thinking, oh my God. Just selfish, nobody really cares, yeah. Well, what I have found in my travels and in my life over the years, the many, many years of my being an activist, is that not only do people care, but the vast majority of people care, and they care very, very much. This is a picture from South Korea, um, where I was recently giving a carnism presentation. It's a picture of people at an activist forum that was organized in honor of my visit. I don't think there was a single person at this forum that was a vegan, possibly not even a vegetarian. I think there might have been one vegetarian, a pescatarian. These were people who were representative of uh, environmental organizations and feminist organizations and cat and dog animal protection organizations. And this was, um, the entire conversation was how do we start to launch a vegan movement in South Korea? It was an amazing conversation to have. The forum lasted for four hours. It was supposed to be two and a half. So, and the other myth that I want to really challenge today is that the vegan movement doesn't exist or it's weak or ineffective and, and rather to uh, acknowledge that the vegan movement is in fact thriving. So one of the things I'm gonna do is share with you some of what I have seen around the world. I sent an email out to uh, some of my colleagues asking them you know, which of the highlights of their actions in their country they would like me to share. Um, and I don't have time to share nearly as many of them as I have, but I'm gonna share just a few. I'm gonna start with Belgium. So in Belgium, the Belgian government actually provides $160,000 a year to their animal rights organization. It's an, actually, it's an ethical vegan organization um, to support their efforts. And our colleague there who runs the organization, Tobias Lienart, helped um, create this campaign. Ghent, um, in the city, of, a city in Belgium, was the first city in the world to officially support a weekly veggie day. Okay, It's like a meat, meatless Monday. It's a vegan day. Officially support means the government supports it. Um, this initiative has been adopted by countries around the world. Veggie Thursdays is now supported by the Belgian government in 11 cities in Belgium. Pretty amazing. Tobias said, especially in the last two years, we're seeing many new vegan initiatives, commercial and otherwise. The tipping point cannot be far away. He's actually one of the smartest strategists I've ever met, so I trust him when he says that. Brazil. Brazilian activists actually took this idea of veggie days and ran with it. They've done a lot more things. I was in Brazil two years ago now. It was pretty amazing to see what was happening there. Brazil's Meatless Mondays campaign is actively supported by Sao Paulo City um, and state. It's implemented in 3,000 schools, which serve 2 million year meals per day. Amazing. <laughs> And now the Sao Paulo Education Department purchases 88 tons less meat every month. The president of the Sao Paulo, um, the, veg the Brazilian Vegetarian Society, um, uh, gave me this stat, they, uh, this fact, they succeeded um, in getting foie gras uh, from being sold and consumed in Sao Paulo City. It's illegal now. And Marley Winkler, Winkler, the president, said, although Brazil is one of the largest meat exporters in the world, the number of vegetarians and vegans is exponentially increasing. 8% of Brazilians now declare themselves vegetarian. Now, this doesn't mean that 8% are vegetarian. I don't think they are. 
but it actually doesn't matter because it means they want to be. It means it's a good word. It's not a crazy word anymore. Poland. Um, we were in Poland. Oh my God, when was that? May, I think. I'm losing losing track. Um, and in Warsaw, there were 22 vegan restaurants in Warsaw alone. We met with the founder of Happy Cow, who then published this. Or who published this uh, Warsaw, Poland, the vegan explosion. Um, Warsaw is the fastest growing vegan restaurant market in the world. Virtually every attempt to build a factory farm faces local protests. This is not just vegans, local protests and sometimes even civil disobedience of local communities. And our colleague uh, De Brucia said the popularity of veganism skyrocketed in Poland and at the same time we observe a growing social movement that opposes factory farming of animals. It's hard to believe your eyes when you see how the consciousness is changing nowadays. Croatia. Um, I spoke in Croatia, I think it was three years ago now. This is the president of Animal Friends of Croatia, their leading animal rights organization, shaking hands with the then president of Croatia, who was, visit, who was invited to a vegan brunch um, as a vegan activity, covered by all of, a lot of their press. As part of their annual vegan festival, um, <laughs> Croatian activists organized a vegan lunch with the president of Croatia, who's not a vegan himself, but a supporter of the cause, which received excellent supportive media coverage. And uh, the uh, project coordinator for AFC says, in the past years, market and interest for vegan products is rapidly growing in Croatia, and prejudices toward veganism are gradually fading. Sweden. I was in Sweden um, last year, twice actually, last year and a couple of years before that. Um, that was a very interesting experience. My book came out in, in Sweden. It was one of the official picks of the Swedish library system. Um, in 2014, one out of 10 Swedes identified as a vegetarian or a vegan, a 4% increase since 2009. Sweden's leading animal rights organization, Durant's Rat, now recently released a V label to label all the vegan foods that are coming out. And our colleague Camilla says, we've been monitoring the rise of veganism in Sweden for many years. On the news, veganism has been described as a new trend during the last year. I am, however, convinced that veganism is a change that has come to stay. India. In May 2015, okay, so this is like two months ago, less than two, two months ago, for the first time ever, India had a nationwide march called India Marches for Animal Liberation with activists from 16 cities across the, the country participating. I had the privilege of meeting Manika Gandhi, who is a member of parliament, um, one of the highest standing members of parliament in India, who has worked on a tremendous amount of initiatives, a very, very active animal liberationist, uh, and she told me India has recently banned dolphins being kept in captivity, animal testing on cosmetics, as well as the import of cosmetics that were tested on animals. Birds being kept in cages, the municipal euthanizing of dogs, instead they sterilize and immunize, um, animals used for entertainment in circuses, and a number of, I just didn't want to take up the whole slide with this, and India has established the first ever animal welfare ministry. We are seeing, an India Against Speciesism's founder says, we are seeing a rapid growth in the number of vegans and activists. Vegan groups are being formed across the country with lots of discussion and support system being created. Kuwait. Um, I was in Kuwait last year, had no idea how Muslim audiences, um, and audiences in the least, would uh, respond to carnism awareness um, from me, an American, and I, I went to Dubai and Kuwait. Unfortunately, you know, there's a lot of it, there was a lot of positive, uh, so much positive energy. It was very interesting. Um, this was one of the talks that I gave when I was in the Middle East, and um, one of the first questions, or I should say, comments that I got after I gave my presentation was, "Wow." So, carnism is not in alignment with Islam. <laughs> and the whole conversation after the presentation was how to become vegan in a healthy way, because there wasn't as much health consciousness. That was a conversation. It was amazing to be a part of that. 
Um, and uh, the first this year also, or that year when I was there, Kuwait launched the first vegan organization in the country, the Kuwait Vegan Society, and they're doing fantastic work. Um, and my colleague Abir um, gave me this quote to share. She's the, um, the founder of the Kuwait Vegan Society. I'm meeting more and more people here in Kuwait who were completely unaware of what happens to animals before they're slaughtered. After sharing pictures and information about it, most are surprised and horrified. I am proud and grateful to have this mission of helping people become aware of the plight of animals, especially those we eat here in Kuwait. This is Germany, actually. This was uh, a TEDx talk that I gave in Germany, in Munich. Munich is not known for being um, the most vegan friendly. Germany is extremely vegan friendly, as you'll hear in a minute. Munich is known as the kind of like more meaty section of Germany. It's kind of like the, the Texas of Germany. Um, no offense if, if you're from Texas. So I, shoot, that's stupid. Um, you know what I mean. Anyway, it was a very, very, very inspiring experience for me um, because uh, the TEDx talk that I gave in Carnism received a standing ovation. These were meat eaters, 800 people. Um, and in just weeks after the release of the video, the talk reached the top 1% of the most viewed TEDx talks of all time. <laughs> this would not be happening if the world were not ready. There's a two minute video of animal slaughter from Mercy for Animals in the middle of this. There is no way that people would be responding to this if the world were not ready. So consciousness is really changing and it's incredible. Um, I was looking for some quotes to share and I just, yesterday I got this one or two days ago I got this one from uh, posted online. I was a meat eater until I saw this video. Now my perspective has changed. I feel so bad for eating animals. And this came on Facebook two days yesterday. yesterday. Um, I wanted to thank you for your amazing TED presentation you did a few months back. It's inspired me to become a vegan and I haven't looked back since. It was actually longer. They went on to talk about how much fun it is now. <laughs> so um, I also want to, oh, okay, just uh, comment briefly on Germany. I much mentioned that I'm living in Germany, and there are some amazing things happening there. One of the things that's happening in Germany is that we have launched a carnism awareness campaign in Germany that we're running, reaching out to German-speaking countries. We've done this for a few reasons. One is because I have been interested in reaching out to Germany for a long time. It's an economic superpower in, um, in Europe. The German public is incredibly receptive to carnism awareness, veganism. Um, and I also uh, fell in love with the leader of the Germany's vegan, leading vegan association. He's here to talk about Germany. And, Sebastian Zosch, who is my co-CEO as well um, of the German Carnism Awareness Campaign. And since he happens to be here and he knows way more about Germany than I do, he's actually going to give you a few um, interesting stats about what's happening in Germany. So, come on up, Sebastian. <laughs> yes. Hello, everybody. My name is Sebastian, and I'm very, very happy to be here to talk about what's happening in Germany because it's it really is amazing. Uh, I'm from Vivo, which, as Melanie said, is your vegan association. We have been founded in 1892, so we've been around for 20, 123 years. And uh, I often get asked, I am not the founder. <laughs> I don't think it's so clever, but, <laughs> but what, what this allows us, having been around for so long, is actually we can look back and see actually how the movement has grown. So I brought you some statistics out of like, of course, for us as an organization, the most reliable statistics that we have is actually our membership base. And I went back for 20 years, and as you can see, between 1994 and 2004, there was not a lot of things happening in terms of membership. So we have like, I don't know, around 2,000 members. But ever since then, um, we have been growing quite substantially. You know, took our big, wow. I, I came on board. Wow. <laughs> has allowed us you know, to initiate a lot of great projects, so I encourage you to support uh, good organizations because they can really move things ahead. 
for example, one thing is we did, we established a vegan fair called Veggie World. And in the beginning, we had 20 companies. It was a really tiny fair, but it got bigger over time. I bought some pictures. So by now, we have between 10,000 and 22,000 participants coming to each fair. And we started in one city, but because it was so popular, we actually had to expand further. So I brought you a map of Germany. So that's Germany with the surrounding countries. So first, we started in close to Frankfurt. And well, then there was a second fair in Düsseldorf, and uh, then Munich came into place, then Berlin, and actually now there's a second one in Berlin coming up. Stuttgart is going to have its own vegan fair in Nuremberg. Uh, it's a, yeah, also an important city because they have like a large organic fair, they're actually the world's largest organic fair where they have a vegan section now, and also Hamburg. And of course, we're well connected in Europe. You know, Europe is not as big as the United States, so we have a lot of partner organizations. And all the people, oh, no, there's one more in Cologne, but also France in Vienna, as you can see in the south. We have established two fairs. Switzerland has its own fair. Belgium had its own fair. And now we're also going close to Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And next year, we're also going to travel to Paris. <laughs> So even Paris is already being influenced, but I guess the, yeah, one of the leading or the leading capital, I would say, at least in Europe, is definitely Berlin. If you look at the restaurants, when I moved to Berlin eight years ago, we had three vegan restaurants. As you can see in statistics, 2011, it was already 12, but it has actually been increasing <laughs> ever since. So we got like 16 in 2012, 23 in 2013, 2014, about 28, and now we are at around 35. Oh. And if, yes, and if you include vegetarians, of course, it's obviously more. It's just this is like purely vegan. Okay. Yeah, we actually started a program at Nibu. I'm going to talk more about it tomorrow. And we talk about how to create your own vegan restaurant. And we made a survey. We had a meeting. We had like 700 people contacting us to help them open up their restaurant. It was has been quite impressive. But of course, it's not only uh, it's not only restaurants, and we also look, for example, at books because we're always helping publishers uh, to publish books. And we looked back in 2010, we realized there are only three vegan cookbooks, and we thought, well, there could be more. <laughs> I think they have been banned. So, so we did we did some activities, and the next year we already had like 12 vegan cookbooks out there, and then the next year. 2012 to 25, and that's when my colleagues started to say, well, you know, now most of the publishers, they already had a book, so you know, how, how, how far more can it be? But then in 2013, we had about 50 new vegan cookbooks, and that's just the new vegan cookbooks that came out this year, so you have to keep in mind the ones that came out the year before, you could still sell them. <laughs> and, and and last year, I mean, I, I gave that present, or like that part till last year at their conference here, but now we have the statistics for 2014 as well, and it has been 18 years. 14 This has been, yeah, quite successful. So, but it's not only the number of books here, you know, now some might argue if you want to play devil's advocate, well, maybe each book only got sold once. <laughs> uh, but it's actually, I have, I have a friend who said this, that's how he looked. <laughs> 2001, he, yeah, he was a bit chubby and then he turned vegan, and that's how he looks. <laughs> <laughs> Vegan in Germany, he published like seven books. We helped him in the beginning. Now they, and like that's the, the big books he has sold. And he has been on television and he's like competing with other vegan chefs. And he actually won several times again vegan chefs. And he's the most, I mean, not in terms of vegan, but in all cookbooks combined, he's the most successful vegan cookbook author. He sold close to 1.5 million books in the last three years in Germany alone. <laughs> And of course, as you can also already see, he's bringing like the health aspect in as well because this is quite important. We have uh, done a study and it showed that most people in Germany are reluctant to switching from vegetarian or vegan diet because they have still concerns about health, you know, because doctors they don't really know so much about it. So we have established a conference which is called VegNet. Melanie, yeah, we had the honor to um, yeah, yeah, to invite Melanie to the first conference, which was actually that the reason we got in touch for the first time. Uh, <laughs> and that's not the only success we had with that conference. <laughs> so, 
know, because it has been growing ever since. Like now, uh, next we're gonna have it next year. We expect between eight thousand and eight hundred and a thousand participants. It's all medical professionals, and of course, we're going to invite you know people like Michael Greg and Neil Bernard already agreed to come to you know bring the consciousness that's already happening here in the U.S. to Germany as well to help us promote that the vegan is a healthy diet. So this has been quite successful. Uh, also, in terms of meat alternatives, there has been quite uh, quite some uh, advances. Here you can see the turnover, like the sales that has been achieved in 2008 in million euros, and that also has been increasing by about 25 to 30 percent each year. And uh, this is, of course, very good news in and of itself. But we also created in Germany the first, or like the first chain of vegan supermarket. You might have heard of Vegans. Yeah. 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 And uh, I just talked with the owner, and he actually got some some funding to also come to um, come to the US. They're wow. <laughs> going to open the first vegans in September. Well, I think that's a plan in September 2016 wow. in Portland and then Seattle. Wow. Wow. Portland and Seattle. And then they're going to they're in New York and Boston is for sure. Yeah, I'm not really sure about Washington yet, but he said that there's enough support there. <laughs> and of course, you know, like it, that's gonna allow us, you know, to also bring like now the advantage of the vegans in Germany is that he can import a lot of the American products on the German market, but he's going to do the same vice versa. So all the European products, for example, we have a toothpaste with vitamin B12, which is not sold in the market, <laughs> but that's probably hopefully gonna change once they're here. But it's not only the supermarket because you know ten supermarkets. That's I mean, and the whole of the country. That's you know, it's, it's a start, but you know, it's only one start. But what they're also doing is that they have within existing supermarkets, they have vegan sections now that are provided by the guns. So they serve as like a wholesale retailer. And you know, here you can see one example of how you know it's all, all vegan products that they have there. And he just showed me actually the, what they contracted with the retailers. That's just different retailers that they are in Germany. And if you can, some can read it below, it's actually starting in January 2015. So, and it's the number of supermarkets that are going to have a vegan, like, you know, vegan section. And uh, within one year, you can see from January 2015, and that's the plan for December 2015, it's getting close to 2,000 shops having, you know, vegan sections. So that's quite impressive. And also good, it's not only vegan companies that are doing it, but there are also more and more you know, meat companies that are now switching to more vegetarian and, and vegan options. And that's, I mean, I know some people are, you know, they're quite skeptical about it, but what we actually manage working with one of the most prestigious meat companies is that they're actually using their marketing power that they have to sell their meat products to promote their vegan products or vegetarian products. And here I brought you some examples of that. You are a regular meat eater, you go to the supermarket, you buy your favorite, Type of sausage, or you know, it's kind of squared, and you know, and then you open it up. So you know, that's me taking pictures. You know, so you open it up, and then it's here. And so on the left side is the lid. On the right side, you know, that's where you peel off. And on the peel, it says "Try our vegetarian vegan products." Oh. So, which of course, you know, it's re reaching a whole different demographic, and that's I think pretty amazing. Yeah. And last but not least, we have. Uh, you know, I've consulted Google to just see how the general trend about veganism is in Germany, and you, there's Google Trends where you can see how how, how much how popular certain keywords are in Google. And I've done, you know, vegan in the German terms, of course. So it's vegan is in blue, uh, vegetarian is in red. And in order, you know, to scale it up, because you know, one might argue that over time people just go more on the internet, so every keyword is looked up more. I've termed it's called Leberwurst, it's a certain type of sausage. That's popular in Germany, and that's in yellow. And you can see what's happened over time. So in the beginning, you know, vegetarian was more popular than vegan, but in kind of like 2008, 2009, that changed, and veganism is really. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's um, yeah, that's the news from Germany, and now Melanie is going to take over the rest of the world. Thank you very much. He's on our side. <laughs> <laughs>
So um, yes, now uh, we could have had this. We could have had a lot of information about every country. Um, and so what you're getting here is a very condensed version of what's really going on in the world. So there's even more to be excited about. I'm just going to share a few more uh, pieces of information about a few more countries. In Indonesia, this is our colleague Susianto. He's a doctor. He's also the president of the Indo Indonesian Vegan and Vegetarian Societies. Um, the Indonesian Vegetarian Society and Vegan Society have 57 branches and 100,000 members. Um, it's a very, very veg-friendly uh, country. There are an estimated 2 million vegetarians, including vegans, in, in Indonesia. This is actually a stat I got from last year, so it's probably higher now. Just a couple more. Luxembourg here, thanks to Jeff Manis, who works for us at Beyond Carnism, but he's the, the former spokesperson of the Luxembourg uh, Vegan Society put together this wonderful collage and um, has talked about how the benefits of veganism have been discussed at every print, radio, and television media outlet in Luxembourg. Um, he's been, I think, on all of them, haven't you? Yeah, pretty much. You can see his face all over there. Um, and they've also done a great job of speaking about carnism. Um, Jeff, you can read this. It's <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, actually five years ago the media in Luxembourg never discussed veganism at all. But since the foundation of the Vegan Society Luxembourg in 2010, every month there has been a positive news story of veganism. And the support of the media is just amazing and has, it has helped us dramatically shift the public's opinion of veganism. It has just been amazing to see this. The UK um, Vegan Society was actually successful in shaping legislation that pro now provides le vegans legal protection as a minority group. Uh, <laughs> More to come. In Africa, um, our colleagues in Nigeria um, talked about, told us how less than a year ago the Nigerian Vegetarian Society started a Meatless Mondays campaign. It's been featured in the media, it's been endorsed, now currently being endorsed by celebrities, and it's been adopted by four other African countries. In 2009, the Vegetarian Society of Ghana hosted the second West Africa Vegetarian Congress. As part of this event, they arranged a march to the government health ministry. The African Vegetarian Union is actually going to host the first ever World Veg Fest in Africa in 2017. Very excited where Sebastian and I are intending to go uh, speak. And um, the president of the Nigerian Vegetarian Society would like me to share this quote with you. Promoting being vegetarian and compassionate living in Africa is one sure way of halting poverty, hunger, and conflicts in the continent. Wow. Mm -hmm. And um, Nigerian television is actually going to be interviewing me when I'm back in Berlin in a few weeks in Summerfest to talk about carnism and bring that concept to Nigeria. Uh, um, Malaysia, where are we? Um, in Malaysia, <laughs> Malaysia hosted the 41st World Veg Fest um, in Kuala Lumpur. It attracted about 1,000 delegates and 10,000 visitors. Sebastian and I were there. We had an opportunity to meet with people in positions of leadership in um, Southeast Asian organizations, and it was really exciting to hear what they're doing. Uh, South Korea, where I mentioned I spoke recently, I gave a tour of South Korea um, in June. Again, just this past June, 2015, the first formally organized national vegetarian organization was launched in Korea. They're calling it Veggie Peace. <laughs> It, my book came out in Korean three years ago, and when I was in Korea, I found that Why We Love Dogs Eat Pigs and Wear Cows is actually a government pick by the city of Seoul. It's recommended reading for young readers, and it, I didn't know any of this until I got there. Um, and it's actually been officially recognized by um, a variety of uh, governing bodies, which was really surprising to me and really telling. It says a lot. Uh, about the public and what the public is ready for. Um, after I gave a talk, I just wanted to share this because this really captures, you know, this idea that people don't care. This really challenges that myth. A young man came up to me after my talk in Seoul and handed me a little folded up note and said, thank you for your wonderful presentation. I hope too many Koreans can feel many things from you. I ate meats, but I will reduce meats on my table. And finally, I don't eat meats anymore, I promise. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, my dear Melanie Joy. You are my mentor. Aww.
are changing and the world is changing. In Israel, you probably heard a lot about Israel yesterday. It's the first country, there was so much I could have said about Israel, I just had to really narrow it down. First country in the world where Domino's Pizza has added vegan cheese. Wow. Um, there are over 1,500 different products now labeled vegan in the country. Israel's president is a vegetarian. Um, and in uh, Omri Paz, the founder of Vegan Friendly, one of their leading organizations, said in only three years, Israel transformed from an average nation with less than 1% vegans to one of the most vegan countries in the world. There isn't a week without a huge vegan news item or major action. You can see this Yahoo um, article in the land of milk and honey, Israel's, Israelis turn vegan. Italy. Uh, you may or may not be familiar with the Green Hill campaign in Italy, an amazing campaign. Um, in 2012, Italian activists broke into and stormed the Green Hill vivisection breeding facility. Okay? They were breeding um, beagles in this facility to liberate dozens of beagle puppies in one of the, if not the most successful, open rescues in the history of the animal rights, uh, animal liberation movement. Really interesting about this campaign, the Italian media jumped on it and immediately spread not the message, the activists' message. Throughout the country, the public, the day after the campaign, the public was in the streets cheering for the success of the activists who were ended up getting arrested um, for having broken into the facility. Um, the public was on their side. Thousands of Italians then became involved in supporting the campaign, so it wasn't just animal rights activists, which led to the first ever law banning the breeding of dogs, cats, and non-human primates for research. And getting that And getting back to you know the focus on veganism here, there were a number of people who actually ended up becoming vegan as a result of this. I wanted to share with you um, a clip from the BBC's coverage of the campaign. You might notice that the police are not doing too much to stop the protesters the demonstrators. Police are just standing there letting people walk past them. It's really There's no audio in the video? Not in this. <laughs> it was an amazing campaign. get some good media coverage, they carry coffins through the city, they have a silent vigil um, in honor of the victims of carnism. The Czech Vegan Society is actually coordinating vegan cuisine education for culinary students in partnership with an official Czech co cooking association now. And um, the CEO of one of their main organizations said, wanted me to share this with you, we believe, we're trying and we believe that we really can change something. We will never save all animals' lives, but we can save at least some of them. And if we can't, it's all worth it. Australia. Australia now has an animal justice party, and they recently got the first representative elected to parliament. The conveyor of the animal justice party in Victoria said veganism is everywhere. In 2009, my home city of Melbourne had three purely vegan reg vegetarian restaurants. We now have over 35. We are approaching the sharp curve of social change. In Spain, I don't know if anybody from Animal Equality is here. Anybody in the room here? Okay, so my colleagues in Animal Equality did a fantastic job of organizing a tour for me when I was in Spain. And this was a couple of years ago. This was a press conference that we gave a couple of years ago for the release of my book in Spanish. 
They had warned me um, that the Spanish public was not really used to the concept of vegetarianism. The idea of not eating red meat was a little bit scary <laughs> at the time. Um, now, um, in June 2015, it was announced that the book, my book became a national bestseller in Spain. When we were at the press conference um, and we were talking, we each had a chance to talk about carnism, the first question that came from one of the press officers, and this was national press that was there, the first question that, that was asked was, what can we do to help? And the very next day, in the leading Spanish newspapers all over the country and then extending to South America, they had articles with a subheading, um, uh, I, I'm thinking of it in Spanish, active witnesses, um, testigos activos, active witnesses, how you can help in the transformation of the oppressive system that is carnism. These were meat eaters. Um, the speaking tour now has been on, I've been on uh, in five continents and 27 countries. Why We Love Dogs will be in, in 11 languages soon. Uh, in June, I gave a presentation in Mexico um, for at a conference that was drafting a charter of human obligations to present to the United Nations that was co-hosted by the National University of Mexico. And they're now going to include farmed animals and carnism in that charter to the United Nations. And that's a, a huge change. The fact that they invited me to give this talk uh, to a meat eating, in a meat eating conference and were so willing and supportive and willing to include this tells you the time is, you know, 10 years ago, this would never have happened. It's completely amazing. And I'm gonna skip over um, some information because I wanna make sure we have enough time. This speaking tour I should mention is supported by um, the Greenbaum Foundation. Are you here, Jim and Lucy, in the room? Okay, they're, they're, um, they run the Greenbaum Foundation and they actually have funded the tour. And all of our work at Carnism Awareness is supported by John Moncrief and a well-fed world. So it's been pretty fantastic. So I want to just kind of end with talking about, you know, what, what, what can we learn from this? Um, you know, what I have found is that activists around the world share the same key struggles and they have to deal with the same key issues and it's fa facing these challenges that have enabled them to be as successful as they are. So I'm just going to share, you know, some of these with you. Burnout, maybe you can relate to some of this just a little bit. Traumatization, disrupted relationships. No, nobody here has that issue, right? Of course not. Lack of communication skills sometimes. And of course, despair, as I said, the Achilles heel of the movement. So I want to just give a few tips for, you know, what, what we have found works um, to help us stay active, empowered, and do what we're doing even more effectively. Don't believe the negative messages of carnistic culture. Don't believe in the stereotypes of secondary defenses. So we're called overly emotional. Have you heard this before? Right? Instead, recognize that when it comes to animal exploitation, carnism, the world needs more emotion, not less. The problem is not the people who feel. The problem is the people who aren't. Um, we're called sometimes eating disordered or maybe picky eaters, you know, if you, you won't pick the ham off the chef's salad and eat it, just like somebody else might not pick off the golden retriever and eat the salad. Yeah. Um, we're hypocrites if we wear leather, but we're extremists if we don't. If we're angry, we're anti-human. If we express, you know, if we're, we're talking about peace, then we're totally loving tree hugging hippies. So recognize these stereotypes for what they are. Don't buy into them. Don't make any apologies for who you are and what you stand for. Who you are and what you stand for is the only thing standing between the animals and what would be an even worse fate for them, no doubt. Embrace perfect imperfection. We are not supposed to be perfect. We can't be perfect. How many of you have pretended that you're not sick because you don't want people to say it's your veganism? <laughs> right. You have permission to get sick. <laughs> you know, when the guy next door has like a quadruple bypass and it's like bad genetics, you know, and you sneeze and it's your diet, that's not fair. <laughs> so we do not have to be paragons, you know, that have the morals of the Buddha, and we don't have to be experts on everything. We don't have to have all the answers to the problem of carnism simply to talk about veganism. It's okay. We can advocate veganism, live our truth, without having to be perfect, without having to be experts. We don't have to advocate all the time. 
sometimes you want to go to a party and just have a beer and chill out and not be the vegan <laughs> advocating and not leave and say, God, I should have said that. Maybe then he wouldn't have had so much cheese. I mean, it's not up to us. You really, it's really important to give yourself to permission to not be an activist all the time. Otherwise, it's exhausting. It's really exhausting. Sometimes you just want to be, and that's okay. Colleen Patrick Goudreau says, just plant seeds. That's the goal, just plant seeds. When you do advocate, it's helpful to do so through sharing your own story, right? All of my advocacy comes from sharing my own story. This is me, part of my story. I, whether I'm on television, radio, in front of 800 meat eaters, you know, or sitting next to somebody on the plane, people say, why are you vegan? I say, because I look at the dog, who I loved like a family member, I grew up eating meat, I never made the connection. It's my story. Nobody can make your story wrong. You don't have to hammer them with the facts. Just plant seeds by sharing what's true for you, and defenses go down quite a bit. People will change when they're ready and not a moment before. And it, we can't make people change, and it's not up to us to do that. Um, I highly recommend learning effective communication. I'll be publishing some more information on this, but one book that I find is really great is called Messages. It's on my website, carnism.org. In my book, Strategic Action for Animals, I have it here. I have a section on effective advocacy. So learning effective communication skills can help so that you don't leave that conversation saying, what a kind of shoulda, why did I say that? Um, it just makes it a lot easier. Anyway, if you go to carnism.org under resources, you can find them there. Um, prevent and treat SDSD. I just very. I'm going to mention this very briefly before I even say what SDSD STSD is. I'd like to just raise your hand if you or anybody you know has ever had any of the following experiences as a direct result of your activism or your veganism. Depression. You or anybody you know. Okay. Irritability. There we go. <laughs> Intrusive thoughts of animal suffering. It just comes in your head over and over again. Night.